Hi, my name is Linda Woytan. I've been a teacher and a consultant for 45 years. And during that time, I've been very fortunate to work with a number of K-12 Japan projects. In my introduction here, I've listed some of those for you. They include a textbook study project, development of a national network, and of course, work with the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia, NCTA. Based upon these past experiences, NCTA asked me to develop a class app reflecting upon my perspectives on the field of K-12 Japan studies. Needless to say, this was a daunting task. And so I decided to develop 10 milestones reflecting the field. Needless to say, some important things have to be left out. So let's get started and take a look at these 10 milestones. The first I have here are pioneers in the field. Any list of pioneers would have to include Franklin Buchanan and Ogan Hines. Today, we honor both of them through prizes. The Franklin Buchanan Prize offered by the Committee on Teaching About Asia of the Association for Asian Studies yearly honors a significant curriculum development publication. The Elgin Hines Outstanding Teacher Award which is sponsored by the United States Japan Foundation, USJF, yearly honors two teachers, two outstanding teachers, one being in the field of pre-collegiate Japan studies, the other in the humanities. And thinking about the, the marvelous contributions of Franklin Buchanan, one has to mention focus on Asian studies. When I was a young teacher assigned to teach an Asian studies class at the high school level, I was challenged to find appropriate materials for my classroom. But it's safe to say my teaching life was significantly changed when I came across focus on Asian studies. Franklin Buchanan was more than the founder and the editor of this marvelous publication he was the soul and the source of it. As a young teacher for $2 every year, I could find a treasure trove in my mailbox three times a year. Chock-a-block full of information, 48 pages in length approximately, focus on Asian studies, provided announcements, reviews, and evaluations of programs. It, it was in many ways a gatekeeper for the field. And as you can see, as a teacher, I wrote to Franklin Buchanan and told him just how important and significant and useful this resource was for me. Algen Hines was in many ways a teacher's teacher. His very useful guide to planning a teacher's workshop on Japan was more than a cook, he called it a cookbook, but it was more than a cookbook. As he said, it was not a complete recipe, rather a foundation. And to build upon that foundation, he presented a series of wonderful questions, asking us to think about why are we doing this workshop? And ultimately, how is it going to help our students? At the end of this publication, in very pragmatic fashion, Elgin Hines presented a thoughtful che checklist just to make sure that we had covered all the important aspects of the workshop. Another important publication was actually a film guide as well as a workshop guide. It focused on the film, it was a film, a 16 millimeter sound film as indicated, called Teaching About Japan. And in this film, Elgin Hines actually led a workshop of teachers sitting in students' desks, functioning again as students. And so it was in a sense a workshop within a workshop. The film was segmented, it contained a number of engaging activities, and it was meant to be used in a live workshop, in an actual workshop, stopped so that, again, the workshop attendees could engage in these activities. Through this film, we learned about concepts such as mental maps, the rule of 70, 
and how to help our students differentiate amongst fact, inference, and opinion. The second milestone we'll take a look at is early resources in the field of Japan studies, as well as the complementary field of global education. Opening Doors was the culmination of a project whereby a binational team, US and Japanese educators, attempted to literally, as the title says, open doors onto contemporary Japan. This volume published by the Asia Society consisted of a series of thematic units, and they were based upon the idea of systems in terms of global education. The volume also contained a very lengthy resource section, very helpful at the back. Two other resources of significance were Asia, Teaching About Learning From, and as we can see from the title, Teaching About Asia, but more importantly, Learning From. It was a combination of both pedagogy as well as philosophy, and perhaps most importantly, it cautioned us to first think about learning from and hearing Asian voices before attempting to teach about them. The other resource here, Perspectives on Japan, a bulletin published by National Council for the Social Studies, actually provided exactly that. The majority of authors were Japanese. They covered topics such as education, women's studies, and the economy. And for many of us, it was the first time to read in English about these topics from a Japanese author's perspective. In 1979, two important resources in global education were published. Jim Becker, called by many the father of global education, published his book, Schooling for a Global Age, which contained a number of chapters by leaders in the field, and they reflected the current research and thinking in the field regarding socialization and pedagogy. One of the chapters was authored by Lee Anderson. And here we see a book by him entitled Schooling and Citizenship in a Global Age. In this book, he taught us how to look at the world as a system. Also in this book, he introduced us to the concept of the J-curve. The idea being if you have you, if you have something doubling, the increase at first is incremental, but then eventually it becomes exponential. And so if you were to graph it, it, it would actually look on a chart like the letter J. And it becomes an important concept when we think about global ed education as a system, especially today when we think perhaps about the explosion of information and technology. In 1979, I developed a booklet to help teachers find free resources. Teachers about Japan. Teachers wanted to teach about Japan, but they didn't have a budget to do it. So this was, in essence, a guide to both print and audiovisual, as we call them, resources that they could tap into. The book had a number of iterations. On the right, you see a, um, a later version. Perhaps the most important resource mentioned and uh, found by teachers was this map of Japan distributed by the Japanese Consulate General in the United States. This is the desktop version. There was also a wall version. The most important part of this map and why it's so important is the oval in the upper left. For many of us, this was the first time to see Japan in the center of the world and that offered a unique perspective. Also for students, even if they knew nothing about Japan, they could look at the inset, see the blue, and understand that Japan was indeed an island nation. Next, we'll, th we'll turn to the Japan-US textbook study project. This project involved educators from Japan and the US who studied each other's textbook. 
Here you can see the report in search of mutual understanding. This report contained background on how the project developed, the findings of the project, and more, perhaps most importantly, the recommendations regarding textbooks in both nations. A follow-up publication entitled In Search of Mutual Understanding, a Classroom Approach, attempted to remedy some of these deficits. So for example, it contained lessons focusing on how the geography of Japan is treated, as well as taking a look at our portrayal of how Japan, uh, how Japanese might engage in multiple religious practices. Another follow-up publication was Parallel Passages, which literally contain parallel passages from both Japanese and US textbooks. These passages dealt with topics such as Commodore Perry, the United States Civil War and slavery, and the question of cultural diversity in both countries. The next milestone we'll turn to, number four, is the Keizai Ko Center Fellowships, the so-called KKC Fellowships. They were first established in 1980, which was a time of trade friction between the United States and Japan. These fellowships funded by Japanese business and industry were an important step toward introducing a number of K-12 educators to Japan. Those who received the fellowships, the so-called Japan alumni, consisted of a sort of informal network. They met yearly at the National Council for the Social Studies annual conference. They oftentimes conducted sessions and they produced and shared classroom lessons. Some of these lessons were shared in a series of publications by National Council for the Social Studies in 1996, 97, and 98, entitled Toronomaki, literally scroll of the tiger. This is the term used in Japan for a teacher's guide. These K-12 lessons were all geared, they were all keyed to the newly released NCSS uh, standards for social studies, as well as the um, thematic, uh, as well as the uh, themes that had been issued at that point. Another series of lessons in an earlier publication was entitled Stepping Stones. And as you can see, it was compiled with commentary by Elgin Hines mentioned earlier. And then a later publication, Nippon Yumon, focused entirely on lessons geared to economic topics. The fifth milestone we'll turn to is SPICE, as it's called shorthand, the Stanford Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education. As the brochure indicates, SPICE has been developing curriculum since 1976. They continue to do so as well as offering professional development and other services. In this um, early unit, 1991 unit entitled Symbolism in Japanese Language and Culture, we see a series of lessons geared to the flex or foreign language experience or exp exploration programs that were popular at the time, usually offered in grades four through six. This series of lessons focused on the four important aspects of language learning, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. SPICE also sponsors the Reichauer Scholars Program. This, is, this program yearly selects 25 outstanding high school students who then engage in an online, in an intensive, I should say, intensive online course on Japan. In a sense, it's a next generation program, an important successor generation program. In the sixth milestone, we'll, we will explore the expansion of the field 
in the 1980s a number of significant K-12 programs on Japan came on the scene. Some of the characteristics are listed here. Most important, what I would highlight perhaps would be the face-to-face -face personal nature of the professional development of the period, as well as the fact that the materials produced were indeed print, and very oftentimes they were collaborative. Here we see the names of some of those early projects. Uh, some of them continue on today. In thinking about topics, many of the lessons oftentimes focused on current events. This Newsweek news source, for example, uh, produced collaborati collaboratively by, a, by several projects, focused on some thorny issues of the time, such as the uh, trade talks and issues such as the importation of U.S. rice to Japan. Another collaborative effort that, in, that enriched the field of civics or citizenship education was the book of lessons entitled The Constitution and, Indiv and Individual Rights in Japan. Here with this book of lessons, teachers teaching perhaps civic courses and other courses would have a way to internationalize their content by taking a look at a Japanese model. Another collaborative effort was with the National Council for the Social Studies regarding special thematic sections in their journals. On the left, we have the elementary journal, social studies and the young learner, and on the right, the secondary geared level uh, publication entitled Social Education. Many workshops featured a bingo game. It was kinesthetic, so-called human bingo, whereby participants would actually stand up and play the bingo game. Um, but more importantly, it functioned as a kind of needs assessment when we would debrief the bingo game and see perhaps what people knew, didn't know about Japan at the time. It was a way to optimize the occasion, to amplify our efforts, and most importantly, to get people thinking about local connections that they might have in their own neighborhood or school. The next milestone, number seven, is education about Asia, a marvelous magazine format resource for teachers. In many ways, this carries on the legacy of focus on Asian studies. It is published by the prestigious Association for Asian Studies. And as it notes, it is now celebrating its 20th year of, pub of publication. Although it's a print resource, we have the luxury of digital dissemination. And so we can now enjoy online open access to all of the past issues since 1996. Also of note, in the past, EAA has included many special sections and thematic units focusing on various aspects of Japanese culture and history. Beginning with the eighth milestone, we'll focus on three important foundations for expanding the field of K-12 Japan studies. The first is the United States Japan Foundation, known as USJF. As mentioned earlier, it sponsors the Elgin Hines Award. Started in 1980, this foundation began funding a series of regional Japan programs focused on the K-12 level. These regional programs had regional names, such as the Rocky Mountain Region Japan Project, the Mid-Atlantic Japan Project, and so forth. After a while, many of us realized that we could do a better job if we networked with each other. And so the United States Japan Foundation funded a network. It was known as the National Pre-Collegiate Japan Projects Network. And as you can see in this 
issue this of forum newsletter, they also funded a network for their Japan projects in Japan. The U.S. network collaborated on publication of a volume entitled Internationalizing the U.S. Classroom. All of the projects contributed chapters, and indeed many of the chapters were co-authored by projects. The topics range from setting up a resource center in a school to conducting a workshop to taking students on um, a study tour to Japan. The ninth milestone is the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership, CGP. Established in 1991, CGP has continued to fund a number of important initiatives, especially at the grassroots level. These have ranged from curriculum development and uh, teacher workshops to public space programming, such as programs for museums and gardens. In thinking about the curriculum programs funded, they highlighted many of these in a special, as it says, curriculum issue of their newsletter. Uh, they especially referenced in this newsletter the, the award-winning Japanese history through the Humanities series, it was, it received, which received the Buchanan Prize. Another curriculum unit that was funded by CGP was Snapshots from Japan, a look at the lives of seven Japanese high school students. It was based upon study prints, photo study prints, as you can see here on the cover, that were developed in Japan by the Japan Forum. These lessons were designed to be highly interactive with students, and they focused on the universals of culture. The last foundation we'll turn to is the Freeman Foundation. And most would agree that the Freeman Foundation has made the most significant contribution to the field. Established in 1994, it endeavors to foster greater understanding of East Asia. It has funded a number of initiatives and I would highlight the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia, funded by the Freeman Foundation since 1998. NCTA, as it's called, continues to offer a number of online opportunities for teachers, book groups, online courses, seminars, webinars, as well as face-to-face -face experiences, such as summer institutes, and study tours. There are other services and resources, and so I would encourage you to visit the website nctasia.org to learn more about NCTA. And as we come to the end of our milestones here, I would like to offer a quote from the longest serving U.S. ambassador to Japan, Mike Mansfield. Whenever he spoke about the U.S. and Japan, whenever he spoke about the U.S. and Japan, his mantra was, it is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, bar none. And I was fortunate to hear him say this at the U.S. Embassy in Japan. And in a follow-up letter, as you can see here, he echoes that famous quote, this brings us to the end of our 10 milestones. And so I would invite you to utilize the link here to learn more about many of the resources mentioned here. Thank you.